everybody and welcome to Story Church. Whether you are joining us in person or online, we are so glad that you are here and we hope you are enjoying this amazing series on mental health. I'm here to just share a few quick announcements with you. And the first is that this month on May 29th, we have a fifth Sunday. Woo woo! That means that we are not going to be meeting here in East Ridge Middle School that Sunday for service. We're going to be out in the community doing outreach, serving our community and getting to know people. We are so, so excited about this. The um, details of that will be announced very soon. The next event that we have going on is our dinner party on Friday, June 10th at 5.30 to 7 at the Central Florida Hope Center. This is like our next steps class. It's where if you are new and are just engaging in the church or you haven't been yet and you want to go, you can ask us the pastor's questions, get to know us. We can get to know you and see where you could possibly plug in. We're going to have some awesome food and child care and we would love to see you there. So the last thing is, if you're a guest or a returning guest, we'd love for you to fill out a connection card. We just want to say thank you, send you a gift in the mail, and let you know that we are so happy that you would choose to spend your Sunday with us and get to know us a little bit. We will not bother you, but we would love to just reach out and say hello. So we hope you enjoy the service. Have a great one. All right, all right, awesome. We're so excited about all the opportunities coming up to serve and to get to know you guys a little bit more. Um, thank you once again for coming. I have the privilege of inviting today. We have been in our um, Out of the Cave series, which has been a series this whole month. It is Mental Health Awareness Month. We have been in a series about mental health. What does the Bible say about mental health? What are the things that we should and shouldn't do? What is recommended? And so um, I'm so excited that this message is called Dream Again. And I'll go ahead and invite up uh, my father actually is going to be preaching for the first time in Story Church. Woo-hoo! So we're super excited. He's going to be sharing um, from an awesome, awesome place of where he's at and he's going to be uh, real with you guys and I'm super excited and blessed that this is happening and uh, we hope you take some notes, get some awesome stuff out of the service. On the back of that bulletin also that was in your chair is a place for notes if you like taking notes um, and we are just so thankful that you would join us and uh, yeah, awesome. Thank you. Good morning, Story Church. How you guys doing this morning? Thank you, Nick. This this right here is the most dangerous ten feet in church, and I was really hoping somebody was going to come up and carry that for me. You got so much stuff on my mind and uh, concentrating on on all these notes and the, the ideas and thoughts that I want to get out and. Um, I didn't want to be concentrating and fall off the stage there. So thank you, Nick. Where'd you go? Thank you. Appreciate you, brother. So, um, you know, why this guy, right? Why me? Why am I doing this, this uh, last two sections on mental health? Man, well, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But let's pray. Everybody, uh, would you bow your head with me? Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to, to stand in front of this group of people this morning, God. And most of all, to be a, a willing, used vessel by your Holy Spirit to communicate what you want communicated this morning um, in this body. And the Lord, help me to, to, uh, to just grow as I'm doing this, Father. And uh, you know what this subject means to me and, and everything that I'm going through right now. I trust you for all of it, God. And that's what we want to do. We want to just open our hands and, and let you have your will and your way in this place this morning. God, help me to decrease because I want to see you increase. Amen. Well, you know, the word says that, um, that in our weakness, he is made strong. So um, I was kind of excited when Spencer asked me to, excited and kind of nervous in the same way because um, I myself am on a mental health journey right now. And uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. But, um, you know, I trust God to be strong in this situation because a lot of this stuff I'm still learning. But there are some lessons that, that my wife Penny and I have learned over the years. And um, that will we'll share my testimony with you a little bit. But how about, you know, the pastor always asks these questions and from, the, from the pulpit. 
at like, you know, um, have you ever experienced this in your life? Raise your hand and this, to, and this, that, and the other thing. And you're like, I don't know if I raise my hand. That's embarrassing, you know, to expose myself. I'll, I'll pose this question to you. In the, in the arena of mental health, I'm talking about depression. I'm talking about anxiety. I'm talking about um, schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, any realm of, of mental health that you can think of. How many people in here do not know someone who's been affected or them themselves by mental health? There isn't anybody. Chris, don't tell me you don't know anxiety. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, all of us, right? You know how many, how many messages I've heard relating to mental health from the pulpit? I was thinking about it the last couple weeks. Five. Penny and I have been hard at it for almost three decades now. And I've had heard five messages on mental health. Three of them were from Pastor Spencer. <laughs> right? Look at where we're at right now in the world. I mean, the, we're in like a mental health crisis almost. Kids, younger and younger, reporting with, with depression and, and whatnot. And it's a, it's a subject that, that we have to deal with from the pulpit, that we need to, to confront and make sure our people are healthy. I did a cursory search. You might be thinking, well, you know, what? the Bible doesn't say anything about mental health, does it? I did a cursory search through um, the Bible Gateway, I think it was. And I got 14 pages of Scripture directly relating to mental health. Does God care about mental health? You better Hong Kong believe it. It's all in the Scripture. And I love this uh, series that you've been doing. Um, and the, this uh, gentleman that did this study, that Chris Hodges, is that his name? Man, he... Uh, he picked out a, the, one of the best stories in Scripture about someone having some legit mental health issues, you know, and, and how he dealt with it. And we're going to talk about the last two phases of that today. So, I mean, already we've been talking about um, Elijah coming out of the cave, right? Well, first we talked about Elijah going into the cave, what got him in there, mental health, and, you know, how he dealt with that. And so we, we talked about um, none of us are immune to mental health issues. We just proved that. Uh, nobody raised their hand. So there's no one in here that doesn't know anybody. Some of the causes of, of depression, you guys talked about that. And then um, coming out of the cave, you handled a little bit of coming out of the cave in last week's uh, study. So um, let's look at uh, concerning the, the way we come out of the cave and stay out of the cave. Okay, that's what we want to do, right? We want to be able to fend off the, the process of what happens once we get out of the cave or out of those symptoms or feelings that we feel. And, you know, we're, we're never going to not be affected by things that are going on around us. We can't expect that, right? But we can do some things to kind of prepare ourselves and to fend off some, some um, preventative maintenance, if you will, to keep out of the cave. And, and Penny and I have practiced some of this stuff we're going to talk about today. So let's look at 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4. Do we have that? So it says, grace and peace be yours in the abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Do you have the next scripture or no? The Lord said to him, oh, that's 1 Kings. No, that's not the right one. All right, so that 2 Peter 1, 2, or 2 and 4 goes on to say that God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness in the knowledge of him that calls us. He doesn't, he doesn't say in that scripture that most, he give, most stuff, right? 
He's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. So, you know, we don't want to get caught up thinking that, you know, oh, well, maybe God doesn't know about this area or doesn't know about that area. That's not the truth in the kingdom. God is concerned and he's given us the tools in all things for life and godliness. He wants us to be prepared for anything that we come up against, okay? So let's take a look at uh, what's going on with um, Elijah this week in, <clears throat> excuse me, 1 Kings 19, 14 through 16. So the Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram, and anoint Jehu, son of Nimishai, I love these Old Testament names, huh? King over Israel and anoint Elisha, son of Shapath from Abel, whatever that guy's name is, to succeed you as a prophet, right? So we see in, in 14, verse 14, thank you very much. Um, in verse 14, um, instead of listening to Elijah had been complaining a little bit there, you know, anybody in here never complained to God about anything? Don't, uh, don't raise your hand. Cause I know, yeah, I, I, I have myself, but I love God's response to Elijah in that moment. You know, he didn't like come down on Elijah for complaining and railing with him and running and hiding in the cave. He gave him purpose. We two talked about purpose last week. He immediately gave him something to do. Didn't even acknowledge his complaining and whining that he was doing. He gave him a job to do, right? So God didn't address Elijah's issue as he saw them. God told Elijah, go back to where you came from and remember your oath to me. Renew your calling, right? So a lot of times in, in our walk, we get so caught up in what's going on, we forget about what God originally called us to do. And I think it's important that we, we turn our, our direction towards God's original purpose for our lives when we're struggling with stuff. And I think a lot of times that's going to be something that kind of keeps us from um, getting into a situation deeper than, than we need to go, right? So Proverbs 29, 18, uh, I think we got the message version there. Is that it? Yeah. Um, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they're most blessed. Right? So that talks about um, that talks about being about God's business for our lives. And I think that's where we kind of get off of, of track sometimes is we let the storm get us so caught up in what's going on. We don't listen to what's, what we really need to be doing and what God's original purpose was for us. Uh, so, you know, part of God's purpose in, in my life and in the life of Penny and, and my kids has always been to dream, right? To dream, Spencer talked last week, to dream is to be healthy. It's a, it's, a, it's a very healthy mental game to look to what's in the future. And, I, you know, it's, it's good that, that we have dreams on stuff that we really want to do. But really, for Penny and I, our dreams are kingdom business, you know. So even the, the, the things that we like to do and have fun doing, we're... We have this back and forth with our pastor at our church about camping. You know, he's like, why would anybody buy a camper and, and go all over the country? Well, that's, that's one of our dreams. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But it's, it's really interesting to see. He knows darn well that whatever we do, it's about kingdom business. And we'll, we find ways to, to infuse kingdom business into anything we do. And so that's going to be a part of, of uh, us 
in the future down the road. So uh, it's healthy to have dreams, right? It's healthy to be in, in, in a, with a vision. You, you got to have a vision in front of you. You know, the word talks about without vision, a man will perish. You know, God says it's vitally important that we have a vision for our lives and a focus. Because listen, I hate to break this to you if you don't already know it, we're promised trials, okay? We're promised trials, and it, it, it's coming. It just depends on how we're going to handle it. I didn't know this uh, before I went into the military. I, I wasn't saved. I had been in and out of church, but I had not made the commitment myself to serve God. And I figured out really quick, I went from being an all-American guy to six, six months later, I was in combat. And, you know, the United States, that was back in uh, 1989. The, I don't know if you know war history or U.S. history. We had not been in combat since Vietnam. I thought I was going in the military to earn some money for college and get some practical law enforcement experience. I was an MP, right? So, and I mean, the, my recruiter didn't, didn't pull the wool over my eyes or anything like that. They made sure that we understood um, what was coming and the things were heating up. So we got a, a, a pretty good sense of it. So, you know, we went, I, I went to basic and AIT and a month later after AIT, I was in combat and um, did the things you do in combat. It took us a couple of months to, to control things uh, with the country we were in, in Panama. And um, then, you know, after my combat experience, a couple months later, I was recruited by uh, the Army's Criminal Investigation Division, which is, I don't know, if most of you probably don't know what that is, but if you watch a TV show, NCIS, or you ever heard of NCIS, well, the Army's version of NCIS was CID. So, of course, we're the Army, so it was much bigger. But what they recruited me for, I was a young 19-year-old with combat experience. I was a decorated soldier, so they recruited me to work on a drug team undercover for the next two and a half, almost three years. So I went from combat to working on this drug team, and I had brought my, my poor wife, Penny, <laughs> down to Panama with me, and, uh, you know, she was all by herself down there, and I was out running the streets doing everything the drug dealers do because that's what I was supposed to be doing, right? But um, as you can imagine, that comes with a, a quite a big bag of mess, you know, and I was still trying to, to heal through my combat experience. And, and to be quite frank with you, um, I was a hot mess. I was a wreck. And I, I'm still trying to figure things out on my own. I bring my wife down there, and now I got a, a, my family to, to start. And I was dazed, confused, angry, upset, uh, mourning, and I, I didn't know what to, what to think, you know. But um, my wife had started going to this little church that was across the street from where we lived on this little housing base. And um, round about one of the worst days, um, we got this package in the mail. And it was, it was my Bible. My mom had found my Bible. And um, she wrote this, uh, this little message in the front of my Bible to me. And um, I mean, I was really going through it the day I found that. I don't know if I've ever even shared this with you. My, my mom's here in the audience. I was in crisis that day. I was in the cave. I might have been under the cave. And in the front of that um, Bible, she wrote me this little message that said, look, we're so proud of you. You've done such great things, you know. And here I am thinking I'm, I'm a mess. You know, and I, I legitimately was a mess. And um, she wrote in the end of her message, you know, we've raised you the best we could. And they raised me very well. But she said, and this was the end of my raising when I became a man. She said, you're not ever going to be able to answer every question that you have. But this book can and that to me was, mom didn't know that. She, she, maybe she did know it. That's a direct 
quote of that scripture I read you guys. His divine power has given us all things according to... So, you know, I started reading. Penny got me to go to, to, to that church. And um, like the first night there, God just changed my heart and got a hold of me and said, okay, this is how we're going to do this. And I mean, I had some great, uh, some great direction in the pastor and everything, and, and that helped quite a bit. But uh, following that, you know, we finished up and I got to the point where I could at least shelf the stuff that I had been through that I wasn't able to deal with. And um, I didn't know why that was at that point, but I found out later on. Um, we came back to the United States and we were hard at it, serving and doing our thing. And of course, we had Sarah, Sarah, my little Panamanian. So I, if you guys didn't know, Sarah's Panamanian. She has a social security number and everything. Um, so we came back as a family. We were able to keep it together God, by God's grace. And um, we were back in the United States. We had Hannah, our second daughter, our second, our second blessing, we like to call her. And then um, we tried for seven years and then Hannah came. And then we thought, hey, we were all done. You know, that's probably going to be about it. And uh, I mean, long story short, a year later, we find out that Penny's pregnant again, and she's been carrying for four months. At the point we found out, Penny went one more month and delivered. At five months, we had our third daughter, who's a micro preemie. And um, from there, man, I thought I was in a cave before. Well, now I had a foundation of faith, you know? So I wasn't under the cave anymore, but I had I retreated my family back into the cave. Faith went through it, and we went through it with her for a good, solid three, four years. She was in ICU for ooh, seven, six months, seven months altogether, back and forth, and uh, it, it was a struggle. She had something like 14 brain surgeries before we left the hospital. At three pounds, she came home. And... Uh, to say it the least, it was a, it was a struggle. And um, from that point forward, our whole focus was about the battle we were in. So the rest of this stuff that I had going on, God gave me the grace to just put it aside. And we spent the next 20 years in combat mode. You know, I, I call my wife my battle buddy all the time, and it, it, it gets on her nerves sometimes. But after I explained it to her, I, I think she understands better. And, and all my girls became my battle buddies. They were my little squad, you know. So we, we had been in um, squad, yeah. We had been in, in the trenches doing our thing. And, and uh, I know the Bible talks about how we're supposed to draw in when something happens, our first line, uh, this is just a side note for you guys if you want to take notes on this, your first line of defense is always your immediate family. Hear me. If you hear nothing else I say today, if you're not ministering to your family, you go no further. You make your family solid first. And that's what we did. Well, for our pastor likes to say, for every mile of road, there's two miles of ditches, right? So there's a ditch coming. We'll talk about that as we move on. All right. Second uh, Corinthians four sixteen through eighteen. So we see there. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Through outwardly, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles. Uh, yeah, we we'll, won't we'll say anything about that. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what it is seen, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Mm. That's a 
that's a that's a mouthful right there. Even though Paul, this was written, Paul is the author here. Even though Paul had things falling down around him, his eyes were fixed on the unseen, the eternal. The quickest way out of depression is to focus on the needs of others. I know I'm kind of jumping thought there, but that's an important aspect. And unfortunately, I'm making a tick mark here because I want to go on a side journey there. I had, we talked about the mile of road and two miles of ditches, right? I had drawn my family back to where um, it was family first. And I knew at some point we had to jump back into it, but I just didn't have the emotional strength to do it, you know? But I, I fooled myself into thinking what I did is out of my strength. God's saying, no, I've given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. It's my strength that you do this stuff in. And he said, guess what, Jim? It's time to get off the benches. And I was like, but God, my family, we're just, the baby, she's still going to the hospital. And he's like, I'll take care of all that. It's my timing. It's not yours. Get off the bench and get back at it. And, you know, up to that point, who knows? Maybe it wasn't time for me yet. And I had to go through some things in order to, to be in a place, headspace, where I could be used by God again. But at that point, either I waited too long or finally listened or I don't know. But well, I talked to Penny and I'm like, hey, I'm ready. Let's, let's, start, let's start this train again. And uh, so we started going back to church and we got the, and getting involved. We were already going to church, but we started getting involved again and getting back into ministry. And at that point, I, I found out that it's in serving others where, where I get my strength because I lean on God instead of my own strength. And that's where he wants us all anyway, right? So find your purpose. Maybe you say, well, well Jim, I don't, I don't know my purpose. How do I figure out what my purpose is? You know, I had you asked. I have a couple of steps here. Um, you know, Pastor Spencer always talks about how, you know, taking notes, contrary to popular belief, your mansion does not grow in heaven. Pastor, Pastor Spencer's just joking when he says that. But taking notes, you know, they say most of the stuff that you hear from the pulpit you lose if you don't apply it in your life. What, what's the statistic, like six hours later, four hours later? You know, so I guess, yeah, this is a good thing to take notes. But finding purpose. Here's a couple of steps that can help you um, find your purpose. Get alone with God. How are you going to, I don't want my purpose for my life. My purpose is not going to make eternal difference. God's purpose for my life makes eternal difference. So get, get alone with God. Take some time. Spend some time alone with God. Commit to God's word. Okay? That's, that's not the same point. That's a separate point. Ask yourself this question. Don't raise your hand, please. It's rhetorical. Are you committed to God's word? I ask myself this question all the time. And then I ask God, am I committed to God? Am I serious about God's word? Do I, do I cherish it like the love letter that it is that I got from Penny when I was in combat and in basic training? Do I cherish God's love letter to me like that? And then if I do, what's my commitment level? How's my commitment level? I'll ask myself. And then I'll ask God, God, is my commitment level good enough because you know what? We're promised trials. You never know what's coming around the next bend. And I think a lot of us get ourselves in trouble when something smacks us up alongside the head. And all along, God is saying, hey, look out. Watch out for this. Don't get yourself involved in this. Be careful what you're doing, you know? So we got to be careful. Um, 
Man, my time's waning. Talk about being careful. Write down a God-sized dream. Right? Rich, you got my God-sized dream? Next slide. I may, I may get out of the screen for a second here because this is our God-sized dream. Okay? For, just leave that up for a minute, Rick. Rich, sorry. Um, for many, many years, uh, we were homebound. And we really couldn't do much with faith. Our daughter was, uh, had severe cerebral palsy and was um, immobile, couldn't speak. You know, we G-tube fed her. And um, we were in and out of the hospitals all the time. And we couldn't do much of anything with the girls. So we, we adopted a divide and conquer mentality. And the whole time, you know, our, we've always loved camping. That's, that's deep in our hearts for me. It's good headspace for me. There's not a lot of people around. I can just go out there and think about nothing. And we, we uh, it's like that's possible. But we, um, all the ladies are like, think of nothing. What are you talking about? Think of nothing. All the guys are going, <laughs> yeah. So, but that was, that's been our, 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 uh, our dream, our God-sized dream, you know. Ten years ago, we shared, Penny and I shared this dream. But neither one of us said to each other, this is never going to happen. We got over $10 million in medical expenses for our daughter, you know, I'm trying to run a family and that's not going to happen. That rig, that setup right there today belongs to us. Not only does this setup belong to us, I got a phone call a couple of weeks ago from the pastor that we got saved under down in Panama, who now has a ministry nationwide. And guess what he does? He ministers to veterans with PTSD. And they go from church to church and set up care groups. Check this out, Rich. They set up care groups for veterans in those churches or law enforcement that have been through traumatic stuff. And they minister to them. Well, that pastor was in the military. He was an Air Force um, police officer. And the, the other guy that, that is in the ministry with him is also was also a veteran. But neither one of them have combat experience or been diagnosed with PTSD. If I haven't mentioned that, um, two, three months ago, I was diagnosed with PTSD, believe it or not, major depressive disorder. So, but that's a diagnosis. That is not who I am. My, who I am is who God says I am. So you got to make that distinction. I know, I look around this room and I, I know a lot of people that are in here. There's a lot of scary diagnosis. My mom had breast cancer. My mom is not breast cancer. Guess what? She's cancer free now. Been cancer free for quite some time now. She didn't assume that as her identity. We have to make a distinction between diagnoses and identity. Diagnoses is what the people practicing medicine tell us. Identity is what God says about us in his word, okay? So make that distinction. Don't get caught up in di uh, diagnosis, okay? Um, let me move along here before we run out of time. Um, so we're talking about steps, right? Finding our purpose. Wake up and do something. We had a coach. I played football for seven years. I played line for most of that time, and then I started playing linebacker. And, uh, you know, a lot of times you get up to the line of scrimmage and we're about to run a play, and the defense changes schemes. Their, their linebackers shift. Their linemen move out of the way. Defensive end comes in. The guy I was supposed to block is not there anymore, and I'd get confused, you know. Even before I had PTSD, I'd get confused. And I'm like, I don't know who to hit. So my coach grabs me by the back of my pants in practice one day, and he picks me up out of my, my stance, and he says, Bowder, if you don't know to, who to hit, just hit somebody. Hit the closest guy. Listen, that's meant to be a joke. But if you find yourself in the cave and you don't know what to do, do something. Find someone to serve. I cannot tell you how many people, my wife and I, and Hannah back there, oh my gosh, 
Hannah was an evangelist before she was one. She ministered to more people in the NICU at Arnold Palmer than Penny and I together have ministered to. I'm talking about people that are under, under the cave, you know? So be on the lookout. I know it's hard. Trust me, I've been there. I know how difficult it is to be used by God when you're going through something. But let me tell you the secret to what's going on. We already talked about it. In our weakness, He is made strong. People are watching when you're going through stuff, especially if you're a believer. Oh, are they going to handle this? Let's see what they're going to do now. You know you know how people can be, right? You step out and reach out and minister to somebody when you're going through something, that's going to have eternal ramifications. I guarantee it. We've seen it a hundred times. Ministering to people that just, this one young girl was, was dying. She knew she was going to be passing away within, what, a month or so? And her parents were kind of in a huddle in another room trying to figure out how they were going to tell her she was about to die. And we, we met up with her, and she looked kind of sad, sadder than she had the last couple of days that we saw her. And we're like, you okay? Can we pray for you about something? What's going on? And she's like, well, you know, she's got the bandana around, no hair. She's like, well, I'm about to die. And my parents are in there trying to figure out how to tell me. And I'm like, Whew. okay, God, I know this is not for no reason. So how can we minister to this girl? And we asked her, can we pray for you? And she's like, yeah, well, what can we pray about? I want them, this girl, man, I want them to have peace and know that I'm going to be okay. I know I'm going to be okay. But I want them to know I'm going to be okay. How many of you would step out and minister to that person on the street? Don't raise your hands, but... That was a place, a God-ordained position for us to be in. And of course, we seized it. And God taught me that lesson that day. Always be on the lookout to do something. That's purpose. Okay? All right, let's whip through this. You got my picture? That's gone. So you know we had God-sized dreams. Um, so that covers the 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 uh, dream again portion. And the next, the next section, the next point we want to get to is we need each other. Okay? That's important, guys. We got we to gotta realize that. 1 Kings 19, 19. As soon as Elijah left the cave, you'll notice that God gives him a couple of jobs to do, and all those jobs surrounded people and things that, that he needed to get with them to accomplish. Part of us coming out of the cave and staying out of the cave was us getting a realization of, you know, the statement, they can't possibly know what we're going through. How could they know, God? And I mean, legitimately, we were in a situation where very few human beings had been through what my daughter went through and what our family went through, you know. But when we stepped out and started serving again, we got into this church. And like the first day we were there, we met this lady. And I'm not kidding, guys. Our daughter is probably a one in 10 million case. We did this divide and conquer thing. The Penny would stay with the girls in the sanctuary one week and I'd go out in the quiet room and then we'd swap. Excuse me. And then um, like the second or third week, I don't remember what the time frame was, I went back to the quiet room and here's this lady with another daughter with cerebral palsy that was G-tube fed, nonverbal, couldn't walk, but she's like, 10 years older. And I'm like, what the heck? What are the chances of that? Well, chances are pretty good when you're about kingdom business because God will help you 
to, to be, he will enable you to get through what you need to, whatever way is possible for him. And that lady was another willing vessel to, to be able to be used by God, okay? So watch out for the they can't possibly know what I'm going through theory. Don't, don't say that. Uh, Ecclesiastes 4, 8 through 12. There was an, a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling? I think, Spencer, you used this one last week. He asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This is too meaningless, a miserable business. This guy was below the cave, huh? Um, Real life changes happen in the context of relationships. Right? That's why Pastor Spencer and Sarah talk to you a lot about life groups and, and being involved with other people because we need each other. Right? Romans 12.5 says it. says we need each other. There's a, a psychology tool called the Jahari window. It's used for diagnosing ourselves and others and the communications we have between us. The four windows uh, are the arena, And that's described as what I know and you know about what I know and you know about me. The second one is the mask. I know, but you don't know. Okay? The third one is the blind spot. I don't know, but you know. Let me ask you this question. Do you have a blind spot, friend? I do. I have lots. Not lots. I have a couple of them. I have blind spot friends strategically placed in and throughout my life. My wife's one of them. Another one of them is Chris back there. Chris joined us this morning. We work together. He's a blind spot friend of mine. Uh, I have spiritual blind spot friends. You need to let someone in your life. And let me, let me sidebar that. Make sure it's someone you can trust with your secrets that aren't going to use that stuff against you, you know? At work, I know we keep secrets for a living. It's part of what we do. We have security clearances. Some of the stuff that we see and we're privy to where I work, we, we could not tell you guys ever. Um, most of it we, we can share a little bit, but uh, we use each other to talk about that kind of stuff, you know? Some of that stuff I wouldn't talk about in front of you guys. My mom would slap me, my wife would run, my kids would... Some of that, it's just not appropriate, right? But we need friends in those realms that we can talk to about that stuff. Do not make yourself an island. I did it for five years, and it almost cost me everything. Have a blind spot friend in your Jahari window. Did I say that right? Did you listen to that? Jahar, the Jahari window. I think I said it right. I don't know. Anyway, the last, the last one, the last window is the potential window. I don't know you, and you don't know me. But God does. God knows all of us, right? Vitally important. God has a system of defining potential. It's called, what's that big F word? Fellowship. <laughs> Fellowship. God's, yeah, were you guys scared there for a second? Spencer's like, don't drop that, don't drop that. <laughs> Fellowship. I was just driving this morning, and let me tell you, I went to my counselor on the way here. No, Rich, not the VA counselor. The Holy Spirit, right? So one of my problems in my diagnosis, not my identity, is I have become very good at 
creating emotions. I know what emotions I'm supposed to feel. What's appropriate for this situation? I know what all those emotions are. So I would manufacture them. I didn't have those real emotions. And I was driving here this morning, and God's impressed upon me. I, I, I stray away from God saying, God spoke to me, you know, it wasn't Jim. It was, I hear God in my own voice, and I know it's God because he told me this. You're done manufacturing emotions. Today is the end of that. So you guys are priv privy to my real emotions this morning. The first time in a long time. And God said, were, were you done playing those games? From now on, it's real or it's who you are. People will accept you or they won't. Watch how I minister through you. So I'm, I'm, I come expectant this morning that God is going to do something in me emotionally. And I hope you guys did too. So the last thing I wanted to really touch on with you guys as we wrap up um, is this. As far as fellowship is concerned, in the very beginning, you go back in Scripture to Genesis. I can't, I've got to open that one-handed. And, and God creates man and woman, you know, and it was not good for them to be alone. We talked about that last week, and so he created a helpmate. And uh, There's something interesting happened back in the, in the book of Genesis. God, in Genesis 3, verse 8, is, is the scripture I'm talking about. When um, Adam and Eve were in the garden and they had sinned, and they heard God walking in the garden. I looked that scripture up, walking. I'd always believed this to be true, and I probably heard it in a, in a message someplace. But because I knew I was going to be sharing on it, I looked at that word, walking. And let me, let me tell you how that translates from the original um, text. The word walking translates or is better defined as repetitive or habitual movement. So the, the original text said that God's walking in the garden was his habit to come down and, and basically chill with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day and to have fellowship with them, right? So we're made in the likeness and image of God, correct? If we're made in the likeness and image of God and it's his habitual nature to come and walk with us and have fellowship who do we think we're fooling to think we can, we can get through this mess, this world alone and without having fellowship? So fellowship becomes vitally important because we're made in God's image. And that's, that was his idea in, from the very beginning in Genesis. So please, fellowship will go a long way to help you keep out of the cave. Okay? So that's what I got. Maybe, you know, you're here today and, and you're thinking, well, you know, I don't even know about the cave. I, I, God is, is the God of the Old Testament and New Testament, but I mean, I don't, I don't have a personal relationship with him. I don't, I don't even get what that is. So we're gonna, I'm going to give you the opportunity here in a second to, to make that connection with God. Because, listen, again, like I said, we're promised trials in this world. And I wouldn't want anybody in this room to have to confront any of those trials without having fellowship with our Creator. So we're going to go ahead and, and pray. And uh, now with every eye closed into place, we're going to just, um, and, and online as well, Father, we just, just love you. And I hope some of this message struck clear with some someone in here today or someone online that's going to watch this later on down the road 
But Lord, even before they have the opportunity to get in a cave and being about your business, we want to make sure that everyone in here has had the opportunity to believe on you. So now as I, as I look around, every hat, head bowed and every eye closed, if, if you haven't ever made that initial commitment, just shoot your hand up real quick. Or if you're online and you'd like to do that today with us, please bow your head with us and and um, and let's get you there so we can see you in the kingdom and we know that you have tools to uh, to get through those out of the cave moments. So let's go ahead and, and pray that everyone with me out you know out loud. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We recognize you. And your son is our savior. And we want to make you the Lord of our life. By your Holy Spirit, Lord, give us direction to walk out this life in front of us. And we thank you for everything you did and your son did for us on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Woohoo, woohoo. We always celebrate, whether that was online or in person. Uh, we are so excited that God um, is moving in people's lives and doing something new. So, as we close, you guys can stand. The first thing um, I want to do is really quickly, I'm going to invite someone up from our church named Lindsay. Whoop, whoop. So, she has gotten the privilege to be able to work in the mental health industry. So, there's a few things that she wanted to share really quickly. You can just come right here. Um, and uh, we're going to get these resources to you. Good morning. I just want to first say thank you so much, Jim. It takes so much courage to be able to speak uh, and share your testimony, especially as you're kind of walking through um, a dark place. And so thank you for being a light for us today. Uh, just a couple quick things. I, I think you guys know you mentioned mental health as being like a crisis. It is a crisis. Medical professionals across the world have truly designated this as a, as a real pandemic. One in four Americans will experience a mental health crisis within their lifetime. One in four will experience a mental health emergency in the next year. So we're all, like you said, you know, no one raised their hand because we're all touched by this. Um, there are resources out there. I know that and I can speak to this, you know, leaning on on our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, um, does more than anything else can. But sometimes we do have a chemical imbalance. And sometimes, you know, God has placed experts and services for us so that we can get help um, so that we don't make a decision that is permanent. Um, suicide is the second leading cause of death for those ages 10 to 34 years old. 10 to 34, second leading cause of death in the world. Um, so there's a couple resources out there. The first is you can text 24-7, 365. You can text the numbers 741-741, either the word talk or the word home. You will get a confidential, licensed mental health professional who will text you there are a lot of people, especially our younger generation, who do not want to pick up the phone and express what they're feeling. You can text 741-741, the word home or talk, and you will get a licensed professional who will provide you confidential support. They have been, they as in the National Institute on Mental Health has been trying to pass a true crisis line like 911, but is 100% for mental health and effective July 1st, the number 811 will be the national crisis line for mental health. 811 all across the United States um, and eventually all across the globe. Um, the last thing I'll tell you is there's local resources and it's the largest organization in the world for mental health called NAMI. That's National Alliance for Mental Illness. NAMI Greater Orlando uh, serves our uh, county as well. And so you can actually go to NAMIGO.org. Uh, you can find every single thing that they do is uh, volunteers who either A, have a mental health condition or B, have a loved one with a mental health condition. 
you can go to their website and you can get um, free education. You can get free support groups for yourself. They have classes called Family to Family, how to support a loved one going through mental illness. My mom has a severe mental illness. My grandmother and I took this class and I, I am a clinician in mental health. And this class for me was life-changing because it allowed me to just go in as, as the daughter and not as the expert. And I got to share this with my grandma. There's classes for those of you who may experience depression, anxiety, etc. And the last thing I'll just say is that is normal. He has a boot on his foot. Nobody is staring at Pastor Spencer saying, oh my gosh, he has a boot on his foot. That's stigmatizing, right? So you are not alone. It is normal. What you've experienced We've all experienced different versions and we all have different perceptions of trauma, but everybody, you just need to treat every individual in your life like they've experienced some level of trauma. And um, like I said, if there's ever anything you need or anything you can do, I'm happy to get you connected with the right people. Um, but I can just stand here today and say, I started out as a daughter of someone with mental illness. <laughs> I have struggled with mental illness. I have dedicated my career to mental health and nothing has given me more peace, nothing, than to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior in, in, um, as a compliment to everything else I've done. But it's given me the courage to just get up every day and just to keep pushing forward and to not be afraid to speak on it. So thank you for allowing me to say something. Awesome. So powerful. All right. So as much as we hate to close this series, we are for now. Of course, this will not be the last time we talk about this, but we are so thankful that you came and the resources that she um, actually listed. We're going to get together this week and we're going to be sending those out to the church either by email or text so that you can have it written down and you can share it with a friend who's like, oh, what was that again? What was that number? That kind of thing. We want you to have access and it be on a place that you can pull up really quick if you need to. So we are so thankful that you joined us today. We finish off our Sunday um, by worshiping with our, uh, with our finances, with our tithe and offering. And so if you uh, have, if this is your church home and you feel God has impressed upon your heart to give this morning, we would love for you to do that. If you are visiting, of course, there's absolutely no obligation to do that. Um, we are so thankful that we get to put uh, God first in everything. Um, next week, we get to reach out and we get to serve this school, which we're super excited about. And so all of that happens because of your giving and you give through Story Church. And we're so, so excited for that. So Lord, would you just bless that this morning? We thank you for this awesome week that you have planned for us, where we just get to start it off with a bang with you. We are so thankful for everything you're doing in our lives. Amen. 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 All right, everybody, thank you so much for coming and have a great, great week. Bye.